When you take a look at the FBI's 10 most wanted fugitives list, one person sticks out in more ways than one. A man named Jason Derrick Brown. With his casual Californian surfer look, highlighted blonde hair, and a mischievous smile, he does not seem like a hardened criminal. But looks are obviously deceiving. The crime Jason committed in 2004 doesn't necessarily sound like something that would put you on the most wanted list. He killed a man and he stole $50,000. Most are on the list for much more. But the FBI had their reasons to investigate the case. And Jason was listed, not just because they thought that he was a threat to the public, but because another reason, he seemed catchable. The whole point of the FBI's most wanted list is to enlist the help of the public. Since its inception, of the 500 fugitives named the list, almost 470 were apprehended or located, and almost 40% were thanks to the tips from the public. On top of that, nearly 60% of the so-called tenors are caught within a year after listing. And yet Jason Derrick Brown has remained on the FBI's most wanted list for the last 15 years. Jason Derrick Brown was born in Los Angeles, California on July 1st, 1969 to a Mormon family. According to his sister Jamie, Jason was a kind, loving person. She also said Jason was frequently beaten as a child by their con man father, David John Brown Sr. Jamie said, my dad used to try and beat the bad out of him because he knew he was just like my dad. David Sr. had his own problems of the past. He was a thief and a grifter that was once expelled from Brigham Young University for stealing phonograph records and collectible stamps. To cover his massive gambling debts, David would continue to steal and he would even use his children as help for his mischievous deeds. So knowing what Jason did later in his life, you could say the son learned from the father. Jamie said, and then he ended up becoming my dad's little minion, helping him with all his dirty work. It was said David Sr. would even leave stacks of $100 bills lying around the house, apparently trying to get back in favor of Jason, who he once abused. However, despite the relatively troubled childhood, Jason managed to live through his early adulthood like any other law-abiding citizen. He attended Laguna Beach High School and spent two years as a missionary in France, where he learned to speak fluent French, and Jason later earned a master's degree in international business. During his mission, he even wrote to his grandparents from France, speaking about his experience. In January 1989, he wrote to them, spelling and grammar errors and all. He said, there are days that are really, really tough when no one wants to listen to us and you just wonder what's this all about. Then there are days that you have a baptism and you're on top of the world wishing you never had to come down. His letters to his grandparents were mostly about Jason wanting to follow the rules and be the best missionary that he could be and become closer to the Heavenly Father. He also wanted to baptize more and more converts and he fantasized about converting a Catholic priest just for a souvenir of wonderful France. In his letters, Jason said, it's as if the Lord holds my hand and takes me to all of his elect people. I love to watch people change their lives to do good and come unto Christ. I've learned that the only way to find true happiness in this life is by following the commandments and doing what our Heavenly Father wants us to do. During his time in France, Jason met his future fiancée, who he married in 1991 but divorced four years later. That same year, in 1995, Jason helped his father disappear, most likely to hide from his dad's many creditors. Jason and his older brother David Jr. were instructed that if his dad were not to return in 24 hours, to remove any signs that his father ever existed in that brown home. And so they did. It did seem that Jason inherited his father's love for money. According to his family and friends, Jason saw himself as a fun-loving surfer with unmistakable instinct for business. He was more of a schemer. Jason boasted a privileged lifestyle filled with beautiful women, expensive cars, and vacations at luxury resorts. He loved to be the life of the party. But his life also included drugs, gambling, and scam businesses, including a photo modeling studio, a toy company, and also a golf import export business. Two of these businesses, Toys Unlimited and On the Doorstep Advertising, were run out of Jason's home in Salt Lake City, Utah. But in reality, nobody ever saw him working and everybody was wondering where he got all his money from. Of course, Jason was swindling like his dad was in order to finance his lavish lifestyle. And on top of that, he got as many loans as he possibly could. Then he defaulted on them and then kept defaulting on boats, cars, houses, and rental agreements. Jason would go to a dealership. 
he'd be sharply dressed, clean shaven, and he would buy a car using false social security numbers and addresses. Phoenix police detective Paul Dalton commented about Jason's appearance. He said, if you look at the guy and kind of imagine yourself as him approaching you, you wouldn't think in two seconds that he was a murderer. He's that type of person. When he does get arrested, you're gonna sit back and say, I never knew. But in the end, the man who loved and lived for money was racking up tens of thousands of dollars in debt. As FBI agent Lance Lasing said, he tried to look like he had a lot of money, but he never did. Jason's sister's Jamie blames Jason's erratic behavior on alcohol and GHB, in which he overdosed twice. And apparently GHB made Jason feel invincible and he definitely got in over his head financially. As a result, by 2004 and at the age of 35, Jason Derrick Brown was broke. Those close to him noticed the change too. In early November, Jason asked to crash for the weekend on the couch of his friend Jared Lively, who was living in Phoenix. Jared agreed, but thought it was odd that Jason needed a place to stay. He said normally he'd fork over you know, $100 for a hotel room and wouldn't think twice about it. It's safe to say that for Jason, the situation was becoming unbearable for him. And according to Jamie, her brother was his toys and was what he had. Without him, who would Jason be? And so he needed a plan and desperate times called for desperate measures. Records show that in early November 2004, Jason bought a Glock semi-automatic 45 caliber pistol and took a firearms class at a place called Totally Awesome Guns and Range in Salt Lake City. In the process, he had passed a background check and submitted his fingerprints that were sent to the state and federal authorities. Jason was really not trying to keep a low profile. His instructor, Clark Apostian, described Jason as an obnoxious student, and he said he was clearly inexperienced in firearms. Shortly after, Jason checked in at a hotel in Ahwatukee, Arizona, near an AMC movie theater at the Outdoor Mall in Phoenix. He was getting ready for the act that would eventually put him on the FBI's most wanted list. On the morning of November 29, 2004, a 24-year-old armored car guard named Robert Keith Palomares arrived in front of the Arizona movie theater theater at the outdoor mall. He collected the weekend deposits. There was more money than usual due to some bigger movies that was released that Thanksgiving weekend. But just when Keith was walking back to his Dunbar armored car at approximately 10 a.m., a hooded gunman dressed all in black appeared out of nowhere. And before Keith had any time to react, the man shot him six times with a 45 caliber semi-automatic Glock. Five of those Corbon Powerball hollow point bullets hit the guard in the head, and one shattered the window of the box office. While the victim laid on the ground dying, the gunman grabbed the money bag clutched from Keith's hand for a total of $56,000 and ran into an alley and fled the scene, of all things, on a bicycle. AMC employees rushed and tried to comfort Keith. He was then transported to Good Samaritan Hospital, where unfortunately he was declared deceased. Keith and his wife had been married just a little over a year at this point, and even though he was armed, Keith never stood a chance. Witnesses initially described the shooter as between 25 and 30 years old and white or Hispanic. However, as the police followed the trail of the killer, either through carelessness or cockiness, they soon found a bike near the drainage ditch on the east side of 50th Street. And on that bike were fingerprints. Those prints were found on record with the firearms instructor back in Utah named Clark Apashian, the same person who had sold Jason Derrick Brown the gun and ammo and now matched those used in this killing. The casings found at the scene were said to be one of the highest powered ammunitions you can buy for the 45 caliber handgun. It said they were fairly unique and fairly expensive. And even in the choice of bullets for Jason, they had to be the best. Now within just a few hours of this killing, the police already had the name of their main suspect. And since Jason robbed an armored car, which is basically a bank on wheels. The FBI was immediately involved in the case and the agency was obliged to investigate all bank robberies. Law enforcement officials then interviewed Clark Poshian, the gun range owner, and he said he had run a background check on Jason, which Jason passed, and they asked for his fingerprints, which Jason gave. But those are not the most exciting parts. Clark also said he took pictures of his client. As he pulled up the photo on the computer, the FBI agents almost knocked him out of his seat. That same picture that the agent saved that day is the picture that still appears on the FBI Most Wanted poster. 
Jason grinning at the camera with his spiked blonde hair. Clark Apostian said that the FBI's visit was not the most jarring that he experienced in this investigation. It was a phone call from Keith Palomari's mother, Lena Rodriguez. About the call, he said, I remember a dread coming over me. What do I say to a woman who has just lost a son to a senseless act of violence? Mostly she wanted to tell me about Keith. I listened to her, that's all I did. Meanwhile, a manhunt for his student was launched with charges of unlawful flight to avoid prosecution, first degree murder, and armed robbery. Soon, witnesses came forward saying that they saw a man fitting Jason's description scanning the Awatuki Mall from a silver BMW. Most likely, he was studying the schedules of the money transport. Also on the day of the murder, another witness saw Jason loitering around theater, but he wasn't alone. Allegedly, Jason was accompanied by an unidentified male. Jason was also seen at the Extended Stay America Hotel, where he checked in on Thanksgiving Day, four days before the murder. Jason was seen driving a silver BMW and unpacking a mountain bike, in addition to having a conversation with another man. To this day, another person's identity and possible involvement of the crime remains unknown. Not long after Jason's face and name became public, Valley resident Max Newton contacted police and told them that he had encountered Jason in the desert near the Fort McDowell Casino in late November. Reportedly, Jason had been practicing his shooting on paper plates and accidentally hit Max's truck. Jason was approached by Max and Jason had acted apologetic and promised that he would compensate for any and all damages. Jason then wrote his phone number on a paper plate. Later, Max called that number several times and left a voice message about the estimated $1,300 in damages. This happened around the same time that Keith was shot. The following day, Jason called back and said he felt terrible and promised to send a check right away. On December 6th, a week after the shooting, Max then saw Jason's face on TV and contacted the police. To his surprise, the next day, Max found a $1,300 check and a gift certificate to Toys R Us for his kid and an apologetic note signed by Jason Derrick Brown in the mail. Of course, the police took all this into evidence. Soon enough, Jason's friends and family became aware of what had happened. By that time, the fugitive was actually hiding out at his sister Jamie's house in California. And on December 6th, Jason's brother David Jr. confronted Jason. Apparently, he had received a voicemail from a Phoenix reporter who was trying to track down the suspected killer's relatives. Jamie said that afterward, that Jason got a little fear in his face and told David Jr. that he needed to leave. Jason told David Jr. that he did not want him to get involved in this. Jason then left. However, the FBI did see David Jr. as a possible accomplice. After all, he did talk to Jason on the phone over 60 times the day of the murder. Furthermore, David Jr. denies that Jason ever mentioned a murder or a robbery. Instead, he said that his brother asked directions for the 24-hour fitness center in Tempe. And surveillance footage did show that Jason was at the fitness center with a duffel bag later that day. Tracing his steps further, law enforcement believed that Jason drove from Arizona to Henderson, Nevada the day after the shooting, where he deposited $2,000 in cash in his bank account. Then Jason drove to Las Vegas and swapped his BMW for a Cadillac Escalade before driving to David Jr.'s house in San San Diego, California. Jamie later told the police that her brother went golfing that day and Jason showed up later on at her house in the night. Five days later, the police and FBI were literally one hour away from catching Jason at Jamie's house, but he was tipped off and he fled. Afterward, Jamie and David Jr. were both closely looked into by the authorities. And on April 20th, 2005, David Jr. was indicted for abetting his brother. He was accused of lying about storage lockers that Jason had in Las Vegas and even driving there and wiping down Jason's BMW, clean of evidence. David Jr. made a deal with the prosecution and pleaded to a lesser count of lying to police. He was sentenced to three years under supervised probation. Now, Jamie also lied to the police, claiming Jason drove away with his BMW when in fact he left with the Escalade. She also told him that he drove in one direction when he really drove in the other. However, Jamie did admit to these lies and she was never charged. She had recently written a book about her brother called The Center of Attention. I'll have the link below. 
By December 8, 2007, Jason Derrick Brown had been a fugitive for 1,104 days. That same day, he became the 489th fugitive to land on the FBI's 10 most wanted list. A weird coincidence on that same day, Keith's mom, Lena Rodriguez, passed away. Phoenix Police Detective Paul Dalton suggested that law enforcement is looking into Jason's past for clues, saying, this was not his first rodeo. I'm gonna be honest, how do you graduate from petty theft to cold-blooded murder? However, FBI Special Agent Manuel Johnson said that this violent murder is not typical for someone with Jason's background. We're talking about a person who in his past served a mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and now appears on the same list that Osama bin Laden once did. But while Jason's life seems to be great from an outsider's point of view, you know, having his master's degree and two businesses and could speak fluent French and this big lifestyle, in reality, he was a $30,000 millionaire. And as FBI agent Lance Lasing says, his Salt Lake City businesses were storefront scams and acquaintances said he may have never worked a real job a day in his life. Agent Lacing suspects that Jason was running check and bank fraud scams for years in order to finance his lifestyle. But when that didn't work anymore, Jason had to come up with something else. The last hard trace of Jason shortly after the robbery was his car, a black Cadillac Escalade. He ditched it in the Portland International Airport parking lot. It seemed very likely that Jason had gone overseas. Investigators believe that while in Portland, Jason also mailed a package containing clothing and golf equipment and sent it to his brother in San Diego before he disappeared. However, in August of 2008, an old friend of Jason's, someone who he had gone on his mission with, said he spotted the fugitive at a stoplight near Hogel Zoo in Utah. And according to the witness, after Jason realized he'd been spotted and recognized, he accelerated through the stoplight and sped away. It's known that Jason has contacts in the Salt Lake City area and he lived there before, so he may have returned there. But after that tip, not much progress has been made on the case. Now in the past few years, officers and FBI agents have confronted at least six men on suspicion that they were Jason Derrick Brown, but all have been lookalikes. There was even an arrest made at one point where the police was tipped off about a person that looked a lot like Jason. And the authorities were so confident in this guy that he was really Jason, they detained him. But in reality, the person was actually a body double for actor Sean Penn. And after they realized the mistake, they let him go. There is a resemblance, don't you think? Jason also made several mistakes during his cold-blooded attack. He left his fingerprints behind, and he even tried to hide in his own sister's home. And the authorities are hoping for another mistake to help catch him. But so far, it's been a lot of dead ends. And according to detectives, they say it's hard for a guy like Jason, who loved the limelight, to just hide out and that it wouldn't be really that easy for him. Detective Dalton said that it's most likely that Jason is living and hiding in a large city, maybe in plain sight, possibly in the Mormon community, convincing people that he's someone else. And Jason's ability to blend is one of the reason Jason is on the top 10 most wanted. He's that type of person where you wouldn't second guess that he's not the person that you think he is. The manhunt for Jason Derrick Brown continues this day. Do you recognize him? He's believed to be using aliases that include Jason D. Brown, Derrick Brown, Greg Johnson, Harlan Johnson, Greg Harlan Johnson, John Brown, and Jay Brown. He's five feet, 10 inches tall, and weighs approximately 175 pounds. He has blonde hair and green eyes. The lead FBI agent on the case, Lance Lacing, who's now retired, commented on how Jason's features have made the search for him that much more difficult. He said, with the commonness of his name and how he looks like a surfer dude in California, we've had more tips about this fugitive than any other on America's Most Wanted. It's caused us to chase leads all around the world. Nevertheless, the FBI is offering a $200,000 reward for information directly leading to his arrest. The most wanted list has produced results time after time, even after years and decades. For example, the FBI finally caught James Whitey Bulger, former organized crime boss who used to share a spot on the list with Jason after about 16 years in hiding after they received a tip from a woman who recognized his face on TV. The authorities are hoping that something similar will happen eventually with Jason Derrick Brown. And just recently, they caught another guy on the list after 16 years. Wherever he is, 
the former party boy has most likely given up his former lifestyle. Otherwise, maybe he'd be caught. Jason will be 53 this July. If you have any information on this person, please contact the FBI's toll-free number at 1-800-CALL-FBI. You can call the local FBI office or the nearest American embassy or consulate. If you like this video, give it a like, share this out to catch Jason, and give Keith justice. Here's what to watch next. Thank you so much for watching. See you soon. Believes that Jason drove from Arizona. Arizona. Apparently he had received a vase, vase moil. Later, Max called that number several times and left a, mo a moist message with charges of an unlawful flight to avoid prosecution, first degree murdery as FBI agent la 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 to cover up his massive gambling gambling glut. The whole point of the FBI's most wanted list is to enlist the public's help since its inception. Since its inception. Since its inception. Since its inception.